Tonight, the trove of classified documents found inside Mar-a-Lago, a property receipt revealing FBI agents removed 11 sets of classified documents from Trump's home, including some that were top secret and confidential. The search warrant suggesting the former president may be under investigation for violating the Espionage Act. Could he face a trial? Plus the claims he's now making about those documents. Author attacked. Famed novelist Salman Rushdie stabbed on stage at a lecture in upstate New York. The author facing threats since the 1980s after Iran's former supreme leader called for his death over one of his books. But we're just learning about the 24-year-old suspect. Sin City floods. New video shows water cascading into a casino in Las Vegas. Parts of the strip turned into a river for the second time in just two weeks. And more rain is on the way, with millions in the West now under flood alerts. Beach danger. The woman impaled by an umbrella while sitting on the beach in South Carolina. And injuries from these types of accidents are a lot more common than you might think. How you can protect others around you. Plus, the body cam footage showing the DUI arrest of former NFL star Marshawn Lynch after he was found asleep in a stolen car. We're going to tell you what first caught the attention of police. And the python hunt in Florida. The invasive species threatening the Everglades and how people there are cashing in if they're brave enough to try to catch one. Top Story starts right now. Good evening, I'm Gotti Schwartz, in for Tom Yamas. We began this week with that FBI search at Mar-a-Lago, and now as it comes to a close, we are learning what agents were looking for. Court documents obtained by NBC News and later unsealed by a judge showing FBI agents recovered a trove of classified documents from the home of former President Trump, some labeled highly top secret and confidential. We're also learning the legal basis for that search warrant included potential violations of the Espionage Act. The former president tonight claiming he declassified all the documents before he took them from the White House. So could that defense hold up? We're going to try to get an answer for that in just a few minutes. But first, we begin with senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell, who's been following this story all week. Tonight, government secrets recovered. NBC News obtained and later a federal magistrate unsealed the search and seizure warrant that made history this week as FBI agents removed 11 sets of classified documents from the Florida estate of former President Donald Trump. His lawyer signed the receipt that lists each box removed. Among the 27 boxes seized, a set of documents marked top secret, sensitive, compartmented information. That's material that can be only viewed in a secure facility where no cell phones are permitted. A room with special defenses designed to prevent foreign eavesdropping. Other documents removed were marked at different security levels. Top secret, secret and confidential. An alarming detail, the warrant said FBI agents were pursuing national defense information. The court filing shows investigators had probable cause related to three federal laws, including violations of the Espionage Act. It's a statute that has been used in prior criminal prosecutions of individuals who are in unlawful possession of classified information. Um, and that's a pretty shocking thing to see undergirding a search warrant focused on a former president of the United States. The Washington Post reports that agents were looking for classified documents about nuclear weapons, according to people familiar with the investigation. In a social media post, the former president has disputed that, stating nuclear weapons issue is a hoax. Consequential events never seen before. A former president and his private enclave under scrutiny. An attorney general saying he signed off on the search. I personally approve the decision to seek a search warrant. The court authorized a broad search of the 17-acre estate, covering all storage rooms and all other rooms, all structures or buildings on the estate, available to be used by F. POTUS, the former president and his staff, but excluded areas occupied by private club members. While most seized items are described with just a box number, a few reveal more, like this an executive grant of clemency for Roger Stone, info regarding the president of France, two binders of photos, and one handwritten note. In a statement, former President Trump responds, it was all declassified, adding they could have had it any time they wanted without playing politics. 
And Kelly O'Donnell joins us now from the White House. Kelly, it would seem as though federal authorities now have their documents back. Was that the goal or was the goal to pursue charges? Well, that's part of what needs to play out here in the weeks and maybe even months ahead. So investigators must now review what's inside all these boxes. Is it enough that government property has been returned, even if they had to do it the hard way? Will we learn why the former president kept these things in the first place? And it's important to note that the affidavit in this matter still remains sealed, and that contains much more about what investigators are pursuing and some of the uh, secret information that could explain more about what is going on here and where this could be headed. Gotti? Thank you, Kelly. The unsealing of the search warrant revealing key information about the FBI's finding at Mar-a-Lago. But so much is still unknown about how this investigation began and the probable cause the DOJ must have presented to a judge to get that search warrant signed. David Henderson joins us now. He's a CNBC contributor, civil rights attorney and former prosecutor. David, there are three classifications for documents and President Trump had some that required the highest level of access. Does that give us any insight into what kind of state secrets those documents might have held? Not necessarily, Gotti. And more importantly, it doesn't give us insight to exactly what DOJ is up to here. As you can imagine, the Espionage Act covering basically protecting our national security is an expansive law, and it specifically covers situations where a person has legal and authorized access to information. So some of the discussions that we're having about how information is classified don't go directly to the point that you can still be charged even if you're in lawful possession. And we saw President Trump post on his platform Truth Social and said this. Number one, it was all declassified. Number two, they didn't need to seize anything. He and his team have said Trump declassified these documents, and so there was no wrongdoing. Does that defense seem like it might hold up? See, Gotti, I would say no, because the Espionage Act doesn't care whether or not the information is, is declassified. And it's also worth noting here that it's kind of ridiculous legally and in terms of common sense to say that one person can determine what does or does not constitute a state secret. But getting back to the overall contents of that warrant, it doesn't just include the Espionage Act as a listed charge. It also includes destruction of information and concealment. That means that DOJ wasn't simply concerned with whether or not this information was in Trump's possession. They were also concerned about what he may or may not do with it. And David, looking at the big picture here, A.G. Garland made the rare decision to talk about this investigation publicly to unseal that warrant. A lot of things that are totally out of the norm here. How do you think this ends? Do you think that we could see Trump on trial? I think there are two ways you can look at this to your question. You can look at it as low hanging fruit. Prosecutors typically are going to go for a charge that they know is easy to prove. And these charges are easier to prove than other other charges that Trump may be suspected of being in violation of. At the same time, to your point, just looking at Merrick Garland's personality, I don't think he would be doing something that he would know would make national headlines this way if he wasn't going after something bigger. And there's nothing to stop him from pivoting and considering other crimes. Think about it this way. You get a warrant to search for marijuana. You go inside. You find a dead body. It wouldn't make sense to say, well, you're only looking for marijuana, so we have to set that dead body aside. As we start going through this documents, it could lead to much more substantial charges down the road. David, thank you. Next tonight, the disturbing details about the man who attacked an FBI field office in Cincinnati. We now know the suspect was known to the FBI and posted violent threats on social media before and during his assault. Stephanie Gosk is there with the latest. Moments after authorities say Ricky Schiffer, a Navy veteran clad in body armor, tried to break into the FBI field office in Cincinnati, there was a post on his social media account. I thought I had a way through bulletproof glass, and I didn't. If you don't hear from me, it is true I tried attacking the FBI. After the attack with an AR-15-style rifle and a nail gun failed, he took off. A high-speed chase ended here in a cornfield, where the 42-year-old was killed in a shootout. Rob Thompson helps run his family's 4,000-acre farm. He watched the whole thing play out from the top of the corn silo. A day later, there's time to reflect on what he saw. It was like any rural, conservative part of America. There's no place for these kind of extremists out here. Rattled to, to see it in your backyard? Yeah, a little bit. You just don't, you don't expect to see that out here for sure. Authorities have not provided information about Schiffer's motive, but these photos appear to show him at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. 
And in the days leading up to the Ohio attack, he posted online repeatedly using Truth Social, the social network started by Donald Trump's media company. Schiffer called for violence against federal agents and told people to be ready for combat, similar to many online threats that have been made since the FBI searched Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate on Monday. Trump supporters went from being generally angry at investigators for investigating Donald Trump to specifically mad at FBI agents. That happened shortly after the search of Mar-a-Lago. In a message to the agency, FBI Director Christopher Wray told employees the security division is staying vigilant given recent threats. But the FBI will not back down from doing its job. Meanwhile, Congresswoman Liz Cheney, who helps head up the January 6th House Committee, is responding to some of her Republican colleagues who she says have been attacking the FBI. She says she's ashamed and adds these are sickening comments that put the lives of patriotic public servants at risk. Gotti. Stephanie, thank you. Now to the shocking attack of famed author Salman Rushdie, a man stabbing Rushdie at an event in upstate New York today. The award-winning author, who has faced death threats since the 1980s from Iran, rushed to the hospital after the attack. NBC News Chief Foreign Cor uh, Affairs Correspondent Andrea Mitchell has new details, including what we're just learning about the suspect. It was a scene of chaos, a shocking attack at a nearly 150-year-old artist retreat in upstate New York. With the amphitheater, the presenter was just attacked on the stage on EDMF. Author Salman Rushdie stabbed on stage right before he was to give a lecture. Police say the suspect, now in custody, is 24-year-old Hadi Matar, that he rushed on stage, attacking Rushdie and his interviewer. Police saying Rushdie suffered stab wounds to his neck and abdomen. Early, we don't have any indication of a motive at this time. An anchor from our Pittsburgh NBC station, WPXI, an eyewitness. This guy rushes the stage and grabs him and starts either punching or stabbing him. Rabbi Charles Savinar was in the audience and took this video after the attack. All I remember seeing at that time was the assailant's arm going up and down, up and down. Um, it looked like Mr. Rushdie, who began on the chair, ended up on the floor. Rushdie has lived with risk to his life ever since a fatwa or decree in 1989 by then Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Khomeini that called for his murder. Rushdie's novel, The Satanic Verses, was banned in Iran, deemed blasphemous by the religious fundamentalists. He talked about the threat with NBC's Kate Snow in 2020. You had to hide for, what, a decade? I've always thought that the word hiding is very inexact because one of the things anyone who's ever being surrounded by maximum security knows is that it's unbelievably visible. Years ago, Iran's government distanced itself from the fatwa, but threats to Rushdie continued. After being airlifted to a hospital, Rushdie was undergoing surgery. And Andrea Mitchell joins us now. Andrea, Rushdie has faced very public death threats for years. Is there anything more we've learned about the suspect's motivation here? We have learned a little, not about his motivation, but they're looking into, first of all, uh, with the FBI assisting this investigation. We've learned from a law enforcement source briefed on that investigation that on the suspect's social media, he has shown sympathy to the Iranian regime, including Qasem Soleimani. Now, that's important because he is the commander of Iran's military wing of the Revolutionary Guard, Gadi, who the U.S. killed in 2020, and they have declared, you know, a, a martyr of the regime. So tonight, a senior official tells NBC News the FBI is investigating whether the suspect had any direct connection to the Iranian government itself. Important Got context it? there. Thank you so much, Andrea. Now to the gun violence epidemic that is plaguing a major American city. As it stands right now, there have been more than 300 murders in the city of Philadelphia, and the city is on pace to have its deadliest year yet. NBC's George Solis has reaction from city leaders and a community doing its part to help get guns off the street. It's an almost daily headline in the city of brotherly love. A wife, a daughter, and a granddaughter now left without their patriarch. Literally the scene is two blocks long. The hail of gunfire erupting on city streets too often claiming lives. This year alone, more than 1,400 people have been shot, according to the city controller. What do you think is contributing to this high surge of gun violence in the city? Well, I think that um, it's layered. You know, one, I think we really, really, really wholeheartedly need a cultural reset. Pastor Carl Day preaches not just from the pulpit, but the streets themselves. Day mentors troubled teens daily in an effort to break what he calls a culture of retaliatory violence fueling the bloodshed. 
but even he admits it's becoming an increasingly tall order. I mean, the access to weapons, um, especially high power weapons and whatnot, too, it's just it, it, it makes the job even harder, man. It really does. Philadelphia is not alone in seeing a rise in crime. Much of the country has seen significant increases in murder since the start of the pandemic, with the majority killed by guns. But the numbers in Philly stand out. New York and L.A. have had 261 and 234 murders so far in 2022, respectively. In Philly, a city about a quarter of the size of each, 338 have been murdered. Mayor Jim Kenney addressed the violence at an event Thursday. Uh, we're doing a lot, but it's not enough. Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner has clashed with the mayor as well as the police union over his progressive policies on criminal justice reform. Telling NBC News in a statement, law enforcement should work to confiscate illegal guns and swiftly remove violent offenders and shooters from communities. Adding, we believe a more effective and urgently needed approach to violence reduction should be to make many more arrests for shootings and homicides than we currently are. A city controller report found that the clearance rate, arrests made for fatal shootings in 2020, was only 37 percent. For non-fatal shootings, it was less than 19 percent. Younger children are getting caught in the crosshairs of the violence as both victims and perpetrators. Killing is really literally the, the currency of today's culture. And for all the efforts at federal, state and local levels, Day says solving this crisis starts at home. What solves the gun crisis epidemic in Philadelphia? Um, I'll be honest, I, you know, I would say it would start with us, uh, community. Um, we could talk about lawmakers, policy, you know, makers all day long. Um, but at the same time, it starts with community. And George Solis joins us now from Philadelphia. So, George, uh, you mentioned that clearance rate for murders is extremely low. What are police saying in response to that? Yeah, that's right, God. They tell us the clearance rate is slightly higher in 2021 to 42 percent. The department going on to tell us, quote, we continue to diligently work with our federal, state and local partners to curb the gun violence in the city of Philadelphia. And only time will tell where those arrests will stand for murders this year. The city, by the way, on pace right now to have its deadliest year yet. Gotti. George, thank you. We're tracking severe weather tonight. Las Vegas is bracing for more rain after widespread flooding drenched Sin City. New video shows water cascading through the ceiling of Planet Hollywood last night, drenching a table game. And this hotel parking garage submerged in water. It is the second round of severe flooding there in just two weeks. Millions in the West now under flood alerts. So let's bring in meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, what's it looking like today? We're doing it all over again this evening, Gotti. I mean, we have thunderstorms all over the place in the west, from the southwest all the way up through the Rockies. This is our monsoon flow, and it's been going it's pretty strong over the last couple of weeks. And you can see the flow comes up over the Baja of California, over Mexico, up into Arizona, and all those lightning strikes on this map. I mean, look at them. They go all the way from Idaho and northern Montana all the way down into the Phoenix area. And in this area of the country, it doesn't take much to get the washes to quickly fill up the rivers and streams and creeks to flood, too. And so, again, flood watches go from Wyoming southwards down through a good section of Utah, through much of Arizona and a little portion there of California, too. Some of the worst flooding that we have right now is in Arizona. So this is our flash flood watch map. The areas of green show that, 8 million people included. But all of those maroon polygons, these are all flash flood warnings, a ton of them just north of the Phoenix area, a bunch of them just south of Las Vegas. And so uh, anyone in these areas has the potential of having to drive through water where it's typically not. So a wash is typically a dry area, but when we have thunderstorms, like this, the washes fill up and all of a sudden there's rivers where you never saw one before and that's what's occurring in Arizona. The other thing we have to watch this weekend, and the National Hurricane Center is watching this too, so the cold front moved to the south, some cooler airs arrived in the Carolinas, Tennessee, northern Georgia, but the boundary is now just sitting there and all of a sudden we're starting to get a little bit of a spin going just south of Louisiana and this time of year, anytime you get a little spin near the Gulf of Mexico, your eyes immediately watch it closely. So the Hurricane Center says only a 10% chance of this becoming a disturbance. What that means is, well, if it became a tropical depression, only a 10% chance in the next two days, it's going to slowly drift towards the Texas coast. So regardless of how, you know, if it develops or not, we will get heavy rain out of this, Gotti. It does look like the potential for up to four inches. Texas is in a drought. It's been extremely hot. Some of the rain will be welcome, but we don't want flash flooding. So that's something to watch as we head into the weekend. Bill, I know a lot of people out west were asking for rain, but not much that much rain and not that fast. Still ahead tonight, beach danger. The woman impaled by a beach umbrella in South Carolina, now prompting warnings from officials how you can protect yourself and others. Plus, a group of thieves attacking employees with bear spray before robbing a jewelry store. 
just how much they made off with. And the DUI arrest of former NFL star Marshawn Lynch, what the Super Bowl champ was doing when he was found inside a stolen car. Stay with us. Back now with that deadly beach tragedy, a woman impaled by a fr flying umbrella while she was with her friends and family. And experts are warning about safety when using those popular items because of the injuries and how they're more common than you might think. NBC's Julie Serkin has the report. Tonight in South Carolina, a beach community in mourning. I'm still in shock. I mean, it's something just like it's not settled in yet. I don't think it's just surreal right now. Hari County authorities telling NBC News, 63-year-old resident Tammy Perot was struck and impaled by a flying beach umbrella. With a gust of wind that came through yesterday, it took an umbrella through the air and it just kept going and going and everybody just said duck and we ducked and unfortunately she was in the line of fire. Tammy was rushed to a local hospital where she later died. Friends now remembering her as a kind soul. She was the kindest person to anybody, never had a bad word to say about anybody. You know, she was the first one to say hello when you saw her. Beach umbrellas provide that necessary shade on a hot summer day, but can be more dangerous than you might imagine. This 2019 video, also from Hari County, shows a rogue flying umbrella just missing a toddler. Senator Bob Menendez reacting to that incident, calling for new regulations. In my view, the only things that should be flying around through the air on a sunny day at the shore should be seagulls and frisbees, not spear-tipped beach umbrellas that have the potential to claim lives. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission estimates there were roughly 2,800 beach umbrella-related injuries between 2010 and 2018. In another incident in Massachusetts, a 13-year-old was rushed to the hospital after sustaining severe injuries to his right shoulder from a flying umbrella. Really large, like, gash in his shoulder. That 13-year-old surviving that traumatic injury. But tonight, a tragic reminder of just how deadly this essential beach accessory can be. She'd do anything for you as a friend, as a sister, as a wife. She just loved life. Friends and locals remembering Tammy Perot not just for her kindness, but for her positive outlook on life. She would say, life is short, live at large, and she lived it. And Julie Serkin joins us now from Sunny Isles Beach in Florida. Julie, this is such a tragic story. It's also one of those things that a lot of people don't think about when you go to the beach. What should beachgoers try to remember when they set up for the day? Yeah, Gotti, we're here in South Florida at a beautiful beach, and Felipe was kind enough to demonstrate how beachgoers should exactly set up their umbrellas, what exactly they should do. Uh, we're going to start off first, of course, by opening the umbrella and really propping it into the ground. He's going to put it in the sand uh, so that it's really firmly in there, rocking it back and forth. This is, of course, guidelines uh, from the government. That's how they want you to do this. Uh, so he's going to sway it back and forth, face it actually toward the wind. You see how he's angling it. That's so so that the umbrella can't just go rogue and fly and danger you or the people around you. He's gonna then pack the sand in on the bottom and what you wanna do ideally is take something heavy like a sandbag or a weighted backpack or anything you got next to you so that the umbrella really stays in there when the wind starts to pick up. And one more thing, Gotti. This is about wind speed too. And places like this want you to know that when the wind reaches above 15 to 20 miles per hour, that's it, the umbrella's gotta go. You gotta keep it closed because they say that that is too dangerous to leave it open. Julie, thank you. Next tonight, the arrest of former NFL running back Marshawn Lynch on suspicion of DUI. Body cam footage now released showing how police found him allegedly in a stolen car. NBC's Maya Eaglin has more. Tonight, Las Vegas police releasing body cam video of former NFL star Marshawn Lynch's arrest on a suspected drunk driving count, initially finding him asleep in a damaged sports car. He said he doesn't drink and he doesn't do drugs. Have you ever seen anybody drive a car like that? That's pretty good. He drove it till the rim came off. A police spokesman says they investigated the car Tuesday morning after seeing that it was missing a tire and had physical damage to the exterior. All right, sir, are you going to get out of the car for us or are we going to have to help you out? The video shows police repeatedly asking Lynch to get out of the car. 
as they discovered he may have been in an impaired state. Right now, if you don't get out of the vehicle, you're going to be charged with obstructing an investigation. That is a criminal offense, and you will go to jail. Later on, officers dragged him out. Go to get on your stomach. Roll over. Hands behind your back. Just smell like alcohol. According to an impaired driving report obtained by Las Vegas NBC station KSNV, Lynch repeatedly fell asleep, smelled of alcohol, and admitted to stealing the sports car he was found in, a black 2020 Shelby GT500. The report also said once Lynch was in custody, officers had to, quote, use a restraint chair to force a blood draw for DUI testing after a judge issued a warrant. The results were not made public. Police booked Lynch on four charges, including a DUI and driving in an unregistered vehicle. Right now, you're being arrested for the suspicion of DUI. In a statement, his attorney said his car was, quote, safely parked and not in operation when police arrived. And that since he was not pulled over for a DUI, they were, quote, confident that when all evidence is presented, this will not be a DUI under Nevada law. No stranger to controversy, Lynch has previously been arrested for other driving incidents, a hit and run charge in 2008 and a reckless driving charge in 2012. Lynch was released on a $3,381 bail. His next court date will be December 7th. And Maya joins us now live in the studio. Maya, Marshawn Lynch was in the news earlier this week. Can you tell us a little bit more about the announcement from the Seahawks? Right. So on Monday, the Seahawks made an announcement of their preseason talent lineup for all of their programming. And they actually selected Marshawn as a special correspondent. This happened a day before the arrest, so we're not sure if it will have any impact on that. And you mentioned there were several other uh, driving-related charges that he's faced in the past. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. So he's paid a ton of fines for those. And going back to the 2008 hit and run, he actually had his license revoked from that incident. So we're going to be keeping a close eye on what happens in December. Awesome. And when we come back, uh, Michelle Branch arrested, the singer taken into custody in Nashville, what she admitted to doing just hours before announcing her separation from her husband. Back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we start with the search for a missing doctor in Florida. 49-year-old Chandri Cross was last seen Wednesday morning, leaving the Naples Bay Marina on his boat. The Coast Guard found his boat yesterday about 26 miles from shore, no sign of Cross, and the boat had no signs of damage. Police in New York City looking for a group of thieves who attacked a jewelry store with bear spray. New video shows employees in pain as they tried to wash their eyes in the Bronx. Police say at least one of those masked suspects sprayed the workers before stealing $800,000 of merchandise. The group reportedly pushed their way in as the store was closing, smashed display cases, and then filled duffel bags before taking off. And singer Michelle Branch has been arrested in Nashville. Authorities say she admitted to slapping her husband, Black Keys drummer Patrick Carney, during a fight at their home. She's now facing domestic assault charges. The arrest came shortly after Branch announced the two were splitting and accused him of cheating in a social media post. And several major cruise lines are easing or dropping vaccine mandates. Norwegian will allow unvaccinated guests as long as they show a negative test. And Royal Caribbean and celebrity cruises will also end vaccine mandates for cruises leaving from some ports. The changes go into effect the first week of September. However, a lot of countries will still require vaccine to disembark. Next tonight, the U.S. women's national soccer team is one step closer to winning their years-long fight for equal pay. On paper, it seems simple. The governing body of U.S. women's soccer has agreed to a $24 million settlement with female players. But a judge still has to approve the details and just move the agreement into its final stage. All of this, a long time coming for soccer stars like Megan Rapino, Alex Morgan, and Christy Press. For more on what this decision and what it means for the players of the U.S. team, I want to bring in Denise White, Press's manager and CEO of EAG Sports Management. Denise, you've worked with players on this for such a long time, and we just saw the federal judge in this case uh, schedule December 5th as a hearing for its final approval. But it looks like this is a done deal. Can you walk us through the historic significance here? Well, it's a huge, I mean, 
It's it's a landmark decision. Let's be clear. Uh, women and and the players and and these women in general with U.S. soccer and and the national team have been fighting for this for over ten years. Uh, it's just made the news recently because a judge found it fit that women should have equal pay. Um, this is a landmark decision that not only helps the national team but will help all of the women in U.S. soccer and abroad and i think it's a stepping stone for helping women in sports in general whether it's u.s soccer it's the wnba it's women in track and field uh you know there's so many other sports that that women are going to benefit from this landmark decision for the national team and and women's soccer because they are really the catalyst and uh, the, the one that's going to help the next generation be able to go out there, play their sport and not worry that they're not going to be able to uh, live a lifestyle. Because right now, most women, especially in women's soccer, don't even necessarily make a living wage. It, there's a very few fractional part of those female soccer players that make a decent amount of money. And even that decent amount of money isn't even close to what the men in men's sports make. So we're really excited about this landmark decision. I have been so fortunate to be able to watch one of our clients, Kristen Press, and along with her teammates, um, forge ahead and fight behind the scenes for this landmark decision. And they're still fighting for more equality in this sport. So I'm, I'm very excited. And I think for women in general, this is this is a start of a I always like to say a cultural revolution for the women that will become that come behind them that are going to be able to see and prosper from this. And Denise, when you see the headlines, I mean, twenty two million dollars seems like a lot, but it's really being split among dozens of players named in this lawsuit. So the ultimate individual payout is a lot less. In your mind, does this go far enough in, in leveling the playing field? No, it doesn't. But let me tell you why. The money isn't even really, of course, the money's the issue. They're fighting for equal pay. But what this also does is, it, it, and a lot of people don't know the the things behind the scene that this is this has helped as well as the cultural changes in the locker rooms at the leagues at, at at the teams where women are now standing up and saying we need a good place to work out. If you saw the NCAA finals and the women got you know an inch of locker space uh, to work out where the men had a whole gym, right? But women, this is allowing women to say in the workplace of their sport. I would like, I want equal, not only do I want equal pay, I want coaches that are fair. I want coaches that aren't going to harm or touch me. I want leagues and I want teams that are going to treat me fairly. And, and this landmark decision doesn't just, uh, the attention is on the pay and the $22 million, which sounds so, so uh, it, it sounds like a great big number. When you spread that out over the people that are involved in this suit, really isn't that big of a number. It's really what the lawsuit stands for that everybody's excited for. And it's not just the equality of pay, it's the equality in the workplace. And Denise, really quickly, one last question. It looks like a lot of other countries are starting to watch what's happening here in the United States. Could this have a ripple effect? Um, I absolutely think it can absolutely have a ripple effect. There's already, you know, two countries, I believe, Norway and Australia, who have already implemented equal pay for women. It's, it's, it hasn't trickled down into the actual clubs. I think it's still for uh, tournaments. But, you know, you already see two other countries, right? Norway and Australia implementing these things. So it can't, you can't help not think that this has a resounding world effect, not just an effect here in the United States and for the women's national team. Again, I see this and, and so many other women see this as a stepping stone for a cultural revolution for women for equality and pay in the workplace. And, and these women being able to uh, be paid equitably for what, you know, the men's team mm -hmm. in, uh, I think it was in 2018, France won the men's uh, national or the world cup. And the, the pay they got was almost $500,000 mm -hmm. a piece where the U.S. women's team won the following year and they got paid $250,000. So we need difference. to see that be equitable, right? Absolutely. Denise, thank you so very much. Back now with Top Stories Global Watch, and we begin with a deadly shooting rampage in Montenegro. 
Police say a 34-year-old man was randomly shooting at people on the street, including children, at least 11 people killed and several others injured, including a police officer. It happened about 22 miles west of the Bauckland Nation's capital city. The suspect was shot and killed. Authorities say it does not appear to be terror-related. In Mexico, gang violence terrorized the border city of Juarez. Police say a gun battle between two rival cartels began in a border prison and spilled out onto the streets. Businesses in the area shot at and set on fire at least 11 people killed, including four employees of a radio station who were hosting a live event. One of the gangs involved, the infamous Sinaloa cartel, formerly led by El Chapo. Coming up on Top Story, the hunt is on in Florida for the massive Burmese python. People from across the country coming in to hunt the menace to the ecosystem. It's coming up next. Back now with the annual hunt for pythons in Florida. The massive Burmese snakes are running rampant in the state, eating everything in their path. The problem is so bad, they are holding a competition for people to cash in on capturing them, all to help an ecosystem under attack. Tonight, the hunt is on in the Everglades. It's nine o'clock, they're starting to come out. Right now is when they're starting to get out and get motivated. A competition to catch as many pythons as possible as this year's Florida Python Challenge wraps up. Oh, nice. While there is a cash award. The goal is to help protect the Everglades. These pythons are eating their way through the Florida wetlands, putting native species in danger. We have a wildlife hospital recovering thousands of animals a year, but they're just being released to be eaten by pythons. With no natural predators, Burmese pythons will eat anything ranging from mice to deer to even alligators. In fact, in June, a massive 215-pound python was captured, and it had bobcat claws in its stomach. So the scariest thing about this to me is not being able to see the wildlife you used to. Five, ten years ago, you'd see so much wildlife out here. During last year's 10-day python challenge, 223 snakes were captured and over 600 people from at least 25 states participated. And interest doesn't seem to be winding down this year. People from 32 states and even Canada signed up. Lindsay and Dan Floyd are longtime participants and came in second place two years ago. They're, out, they're in the water just as much as they're out of the water. And this year, they're hoping to increase the number of snakes they catch. Hopefully the airboat's going to help us out this year. Last year, we did it from the vehicles and walking, but now we're going to get the old girl to try and see if she can pull out a few more. But a word of caution if you're looking to participate. Be careful. Be careful. <laughs> These are not small snakes. These are very large, dangerous, and they can take you down. Now, if you're wondering how those pythons ended up taking over parts of the Everglades when they're native to Asia, game wardens tell us the infestation came from people releasing their pet pythons into the wild when they got too big to care for, and they've been breeding ever since. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. For Tom Yamas, I'm Gotti Schwartz in New York. Stay right there. More news is on the way.